Today I have a new question for us. And I'd like us to ponder and to think about this question today. Have you ever beheld His glory? Has there ever been a moment in your life when you were awestruck in His presence? Overwhelmed by His love and His grace? I want you to get your pen and your paper out and take some notes because we're going to talk about the glory of God, what it is and how we can experience His glory in our lives in a personal way and how that will change us. Amen? I want to start with John chapter 1, verse 14. These are the words of the Apostle John. He was actually the youngest of Jesus' disciples. We've got two young men in the sound booth back here serving today, Taylor and uh, Oakley. Give them a hand. Those guys are awesome serving in God's house. Well, do you know the, the disciple John was about their age when Jesus said, hey, do you want to follow me? And he said, yeah, cool, I'd love to. And all these men were following Jesus. And I, I imagine Peter with a big beard, smelling fishy, you know. And uh, all these guys were following Jesus. But John was just a young man. Probably 14, 15, 16 years old. Like, just like those guys back there. And he followed Jesus those three years. The, probably the most informative years of your life as a, as a young teenage man. Learning what manhood is. Learning how to be a man. Learning what life is all about. And here was John following Jesus. But because of his age, John connected with Jesus in a very different way than all the other disciples did. He connected with Jesus in a very personal way. And in a lot of ways, a real emotional connection took place with John and Jesus because of John's age. So John has a, a different revelation of who Jesus is. And you see that in his writings. And this is what John says about Jesus years later. He says, the Word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That word beheld, it, it means that they looked upon His glory. They saw it. They pondered it. And they understood His glory. John beheld Jesus' glory, I think maybe in a different way than the other disciples really understood it because of his age. In another place, uh, John says in, in 1 John chapter 1, he says about Jesus, he says, that which we have seen, that which we have heard, that which our hands have handled. They saw, they heard, and their hands handled His glory. They were with Him. They experienced the glory of God in a very personal, in a very intimate, and in a very life-changing way because they walked with Jesus every day. And they beheld His glory in all of these different circumstances and situations that they were with Him. Have you ever beheld His glory? Have you been in His presence? Have you seen His handiwork? Have you seen and heard and handled and touched His glory in your life? So what is glory? What is this thing that John talks about? We beheld His glory. We saw His glory. We handled it. We touched it. We were with Him. What is glory? Glory. Well, if you go to the internet and trust anything the internet says, as one of my kids said the other day, it's on the internet. It must be true. Well, this is what the internet has to say about glory. Glory is very great praise. Not just praise, but great praise. It's exaltation. It's honor. Glory is a distinction placed upon someone by common consent. In other words, everyone agrees about the greatness of this person. Glory is renown. It's like you go to town and you mention someone's name and everybody knows them. Hopefully in a good way. Glory is also, according to the dictionary, resplendent beauty or magnificence. It's also something that brings or is worthy of praise. 
We think of glorious acts, of glorious deeds. In the language of the New Testament, the word for glory is doxa. And we get the word doxology. And we know, all know the doxology, right? And there are many different doxologies. But basically, a doxology is just a verse of praise. That's what it means. Doxa means praise. It means very apparent glory, dignity to give honor, praise, or worship. So in the New Testament, we see a lot of scriptures, and in the Old Testament too, that say give God glory. All glory be to God. They speak of us giving praise to God that's due to Him, right? But we also see scriptures that show us something different about the glory of God. We see scriptures that say, by means of His marvelous glory. He did something by His glory. And then we see, of course, John in the book of Revelations tells us the temple was filled with smoke from God's glory. So yes, glory is praise and exaltation and honor and renown and magnificence, but it's also beauty, it's also splendor, but it's also something tangible, a presence that we can know, that we can touch, that we can handle. Look at what the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth. This comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 3.18. He says, we all, speaking of us as believers, as, as Christians, as in fellowship with God through Christ, he says, we all, with unveiled face, behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We behold His glory. We can see it. We can see His glory. And we can see it. And we're transformed into the same image from glory to glory. By the Spirit of the Lord. So God's glory is something that we engage in in our relationship with Him. That, that it's revealed to us, obviously not with our physical eyes, but we see it with our spiritual eyes. And as we experience His glory, we're changed into His image. From glory to glory, His glory begins to Become part of us. It changes us. Isn't that a crazy thought? So glory is more than just praise and honor that the Greek word suggests. It also has something to do with the very presence of God. Have you ever been in the presence of greatness? You ever stood next to a great person? There's something about great people, isn't there? You feel it when you stand in their presence. There's, a, there's an authority and a weight, and then just there's something about them that's different. I had the opportunity years ago to, to travel with my oldest daughter, Sydney, up into the Kootenays and to meet Prime Minister Harper. And he spoke, and then after he spoke, because our friend was a scout, go figure, Boy Scouts have clout. We actually drove the Boy Scout up there and we got to go along. But because he was a scout, and I think his dad was a conservative, like, what do you call it, director. Anyways, we got to go up on the stage and I got to talk to Prime Minister Harper. And it was pretty awesome. I stood right next to him and I shook his hands. He has very soft hands. But you know what? There was something great about him. Just standing there next to the leader of our nation and shaking his hand. And he shook my hand. He was very kind. He, was, he had, had a gentleness about him and a, and a real genuine connection as he spoke with you. And we talked a little bit about life. And, and did you know he went to Awana when he was a kid? Wow. Yeah, hello. All you guys that have your kids in Awana, you're doing the right thing. You can have the next prime minister there. But there was a confidence and authority and a kindness. There was just a greatness about his presence. People who've become great in any endeavor, they carry a weight about them. There's a weight to their presence. And you instinctively know that you're in the presence of greatness when you're around them. Isn't that right? Well, it's kind of like that when you're in God's presence, only it's greater. <laughs> when you're in the presence of God, you're in a presence of greatness that's far beyond anything this world can imagine. It can be overwhelming to the physical senses and emotions when God's presence comes in 
in that real, tangible way. In the Hebrew language, the word for glory is kabod. When I was typing this, my, my, my autocorrect put in the word kebab. You know, like kabod, like a, on the barbecue. Kebab. It said no, kabod. This word speaks of abundance, speaks of wealth, treasure, and honor. It also can be translated into words like brightness and splendor and magnificence and majesty. This one word, kebab, carries all of these ideas with it. But the literal meaning of the word kebab, kebab, I'm doing the spell check thing here, kebab, the literal meaning is weight, weighty. To be heavy or to make weighty, there is a weight in God's presence. I want to take a few moments to look at Moses' experience with the glory of God in the Old Testament. Do you know all the way from Adam, all the way through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, all the way up until Moses, the glory of God is never mentioned in the Scripture. <coughs> God never reveals Himself in all of His glory to any of the patriarchs. Isn't that interesting? He reveals Himself, but there's a, there's a, a progressive revelation that God is bringing over time. And, and it's actually in the book of Exodus when the glory of God is first mentioned in Scripture. And the first mention is when God says to His people through Moses that He will display His glory through Pharaoh and His whole army. And of course, we know what happens the next day is, is God divides the Red Sea and the, the nation of Israel go through on dry land and then Pharaoh and his army follow and the sea crashes upon them and kills them all. And God reveals His glory. How does He reveal His glory? By rescuing them from their enemies against all odds. You know, one of the ways that God will reveal His glory in your life is when He rescues you from your enemies against all odds. Amen. He will show you His glory. He will display it in your life. Then as the children of Israel travel through the desert, the Bible recounts that they could see the awesome glory of the Lord in the cloud. The Bible says that a cloud went before them and the glory of God was present in the cloud and they could see it. And then the nation of Israel approaches Mount Sinai and they settle at the base of the mountain and the glory of God descends upon Mount Sinai. And I want to read that passage of Scripture because again, it, it shows us something more about the glory of God. At Exodus 24, uh, verse 16 to 18. And the glory of the Lord settled down on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from inside the cloud. Now watch this. To the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, the glory of the Lord appeared at the summit like a consuming fire. That's the presence of God. That's what that is. That's God manifesting His presence in the physical universe. And His presence is manifested like fire. Then Moses disappeared up into the cloud as he climbed higher up the mountain. And he remained on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. It's interesting that the whole nation of Israel were in fear. They said, this God is too great for us. We don't even want to be close to Him. They stepped back in fear. But Moses is drawn into the glory of God. Isn't that amazing? i got to wonder what kind of man Moses was. That's a something. This is the first time we see a person drawing near to God's glory to speak with God. Up until now, God hasn't revealed His glory to anyone. Nothing like this has ever happened before. The people are terrified, but Moses is drawn his response is the opposite. Later on, Moses will ask God to actually see His full glory. And you know what God says? No. It's not possible, Moses. You cannot see my glory and live. You can only get so close. And Moses kind of asks God and kind of you know, brings the question back to God. And <coughs> he's saying, God, show me your, gl your glory. 
<coughs> excuse me, show me your glorious presence. And we'll look at this in Exodus 33. If you want to bring that scripture up, guys. It's one of the craziest stories in the Bible. I remember the first time I read this, I was 16 years old, reading, going to try and read through the Bible here, and I got to this story, and I went, man, this is crazy. This is really crazy. Moses said, God, show me your glorious presence. And the Lord replied, I'll make all my goodness pass before you, and I'll call out my name, Yahweh, before you, for I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. The Lord continued, look, stand near me on this rock. As my glorious presence passes by, I'll hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I'll remove my hand and let you see me from behind, but my face will not be seen. Moses could not look upon the full glory of God. In the time of the Old Testament before Christ, no one could see the glory of God and live. It would be absolutely overwhelming because of our sinful nature. We could not see God's glory and survive. There's something powerful about the glory of God. Later on, as the nation of Israel builds the tabernacle, the glory of God fills the tabernacle to the point that no one can enter. The Bible says the priests couldn't do their work. They couldn't get in the building. This actually becomes a fairly regular occurrence during the life of Moses. And again, numerous times throughout the history of the nation of Israel before Christ, when Solomon builds the temple again, the glory of God fills the temple to the point that no one can enter the temple. In fact, the Israelites had a tradition. And uh, when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year, I think they actually drew lots to see which priest would go in. Because it wasn't a job you wanted to go into the very holiest of holies. You see, the temple was divided into sections. And the very end section was the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was, where God presenced Himself during that time. And once a year, a priest would take the blood and go into the Holy of Holies. And you know, they would draw lots for it. And then they put bells on His robe. So that as he went into the Holy of Holies and moved around in the Holy of Holies, they could hear those bells jingling. They knew he was okay. They had a rope tied around his ankle just in case. You see why no one wanted this job, right? Imagine the, the church members meeting. Well, we lost another pastor. <laughs> Anyone else want to volunteer for the job? <laughs> Said the wrong thing on the pulpit and boom, down he went. <laughs> Imagine that. No one even wanted to dare go into that holy place where the presence of God was because the sinful nature of man cannot stand in the glory of God. It's a consuming fire. I think, I know actually, this is the understanding of glory that the writers of the New Testament speak of. And they use the Greek language, that's the language of their day, and they use this word doxa, but it doesn't really capture really the concept of what glory is, that, that Greek word. It doesn't really say it well enough. This was the understanding of glory. They said, we've seen His glory. We've touched it. We've handled it. We beheld the glory of God. They understood that even Moses, the greatest leader in the whole history of the nation, the greatest man of God that, that they ever knew lived, even Moses could not behold the glory of God. He had to be hidden in a rock and let God go by and then he could look at his back. But they said, we beheld His glory. We were there. We touched it. We handled it. We saw it. We lived with Him. 
This is what they understood about the glory of God. When, when John writes those word, words that the Word became flesh and dwelled among us and we beheld His glory, he is writing something that's so revolutionary to their way of thinking that they can't even concept it. They would have one man once a year go into the Holy of Holies very carefully shaking and, and take the blood in for atonement for sin, hoping he would get out alive. That's what they understood. The glory of God was so amazing and so powerful, so incredible, such an all-consuming fire, such a holy presence. They would not dare to enter that holy place. But John said, we beheld His glory. We walked with Him. We talked with Him. We touched Him. We handled the very glory of God. That's why it's so significant when Paul writes that we, with unveiled faces, can behold His glory. We can see His glory. We can touch His glory. We, can, we have a relationship with Him whenever we want. We can just go from glory to glory to glory. Do you know that in the temple... There was a veil. And this is the veil Paul speaks of. It was five inches thick. And this veil separated the nation from the presence of God. God presenced Himself there. He wanted to be close to His people. But He could not be free with His people because He would literally destroy them by His very holy presence. His glory would destroy them. But God wanted to be near. So He had the tabernacle and then the temple was built. So that God could, could put His presence in a place close to His people. But you know that God was never at rest there. He was never at rest. You know what rest means? Your work is done. You're at rest. God was never at rest there, but He is at rest now. The Bible says that when Jesus let out His Spirit on the cross, when He gave up His Spirit, at that moment, that temple veil was torn in two from top to bottom, there was no longer the need for a veil to separate man from the presence of God. Because through the blood of Christ, through salvation and the new birth, through the work that God does inside of us, we are made right with the Holy God and we can behold His presence. We can know Him personally. We have access to His presence. We do not have to go to a priest who then very cautiously and carefully approaches the Holy of Holies on our behalf. Do you see that? We can enter His glory and we can see His glory and we can live. Amen. In fact, we're transformed by His glory. So I want to just look at four ways in the life of Jesus that we see the glory of God revealed. <coughs> in the excuse me <coughs> in the scripture thank you lord the first one is that we see his glory revealed in his works how he saves how he delivers how he feel or uh, heals sorry i have a typo in the powerpoint there i just realized that how he saves delivers and heals in john 2 verse 11 this is the very first account of Jesus doing a miracle, and this is what John says. The miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed His glory. And His disciples believed in Him. Jesus revealed His glory by turning water into wine. By calming the wind and waves. By healing the woman with an issue of blood. By raising Lazarus from the dead. By feeding the 5,000 people. By walking on the water. By healing a blind man. By raising up a, a lame man. By healing a leper. He was revealing His glory. Every time He interacted with broken humanity, bringing grace, bringing salvation, bringing deliverance, bringing healing, He was revealing His glory. And He does the same still in our lives today amen if you've been saved you've beheld his glory if you've been healed you've beheld his glory if you've had him in any way deliver you you have beheld his glory amen number two his glory was revealed in the transfiguration jesus took peter james and john up the mountain to pray 
And as per usual, Jesus got busy praying and they got busy sleeping. <laughs> it was the mountain air. I'm sure of it. The Bible says that they woke up and as they watched, this is Matthew 17, verse 2 and 3, as the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that His face shone like the sun and His clothes became as white as light. And suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Isn't it like us sometimes to be asleep while God's doing His greatest work? <laughs> just to be totally not realizing that God's actually doing something wonderful. Funny to pick on the disciples a little bit, but we'd probably do the same, wouldn't we? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 says that, that Jesus still radiates God's glory. On that Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was simply revealing who He was to His disciples. The glory of God was shining on Him. Hebrews 1, 3 and 4 says, the sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And He sustains everything by the mighty power of His command. When He had cleansed us from our sins, He sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Number three, Jesus' glory is revealed in the cross. Maybe the strangest of places. But the cross is weak. The cross is broken. But the cross is where He defeated sin and death. Isn't that right? Jesus, speaking of going to the cross in the, in the, in the, in the days before, He has some times that He prays with His disciples. And, and this is one of His prayers, speaking of the cross in John 17, verses 1-5. to Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that He can give glory back to you. There was glory in the cross. For you have given Him authority over everyone and He gives eternal life to each one you have given Him. And this is the way to eternal life, to know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, the One you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the work began, before the world began. And then Jesus goes on to say that He would share God's glory with all of us as well. Amen? Number four, His glory is revealed when He baptizes us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John, the, not John the Apostle, but John the Baptist said in Matthew chapter 3, he said, Someone is coming soon who's greater than I am. So much greater that I'm not worthy even to be his slave or carry his sandals. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So I want to just share as we close just a couple experiences from my own life and ways that, that I've experienced his glory in my life. Excuse me. Sorry for having a sore throat while I'm speaking. I remember being five years old and being confronted with the reality of my own sinfulness. And it wasn't so much that someone told me I was a sinner, I just knew it. <laughs> you know, I knew the wrong that I did. I knew the evil that was in me. I knew the disobedience and the lying and the stealing and, and all of these things. I just knew that I was a sinner. I knew that I was wrong. I knew that I had this guilt. And I remember talking to my mom about heaven and mom saying, you know, that God will take you to heaven and, and knowing that I didn't deserve to go there. I was five years old. And I knew this. I knew that I did not deserve to go to heaven. And mom explained to me how I could be forgiven. And I remember kneeling down behind the couch and asking Jesus to forgive me. I still remember at five years old the peace that I felt, the incredible joy of His presence. I remember the, just the lightness of being forgiven for my sin. I experienced His glory that day. And I'm telling you, I wanted to tell all my friends. 
I just wanted to tell the whole world what I knew. I wanted to tell the whole world about Jesus. I experienced His glory and salvation. Amen? And I think all of us can relate to that. Later, as a teenager, we started to attend a new kind of church. It's called the Charismatic Church. And I had grown up in mostly mainline, more denominational churches. And I'd never been to a charismatic church. And I'm telling you, this one, they just like flipped the wig right off. Like, woohoo, that was something. And uh, it was a dramatic shift. But in that church, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in my life. And suddenly, I had a relationship with God that was personal and dynamic. I remember being 12 years old. I was about 5 feet tall. I weighed 70 pounds probably. You could count my ribs from across the swimming pool. You could stand on this side of the pool, see me across the pool, and you could count the ribs. I was so skinny. I was this skinny, short little kid. And I remember going to this, this charismatic church, and, and they had this speaker there named Charles Hunter. And uh, I listened to Charles Hunter speak, and I'd never sat still for more than a minute in my life, I don't think, ever. And especially not in church. Church was painful for my mother because she spent the whole time trying to keep me sitting up straight. We didn't have the freedom in those days that we allow children today. Boy, I'll tell you, church was painful for me. And I couldn't sit still. I still can't. I don't know, my foot starts going like this. And I can't sit still. But I sat and listened to Charles Hunter for 45 minutes. I didn't move. I was transfixed. I was just eating up what he was saying about the Holy Spirit being personal and real. And I was starting to think crazy thoughts like maybe the miracles that I've read about in the Bible could happen today. You know, really crazy thinking like that, you know. Maybe God still moves in people's lives today like, like the disciples experienced it. I was having really crazy thoughts and my mom knew a miracle was happening because for 45 minutes I just sat there and listened and I didn't move. She didn't have to tell me once to be quiet. And then they asked who wanted to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit that, that Jesus still baptizes people with His Spirit. I said, I do. And so did 400 other people. And so there wasn't room for them all to come to the front. So I was kind of standing back there behind a crowd of people and I was this skinny, short, 12-year-old boy. And there was a large woman in front of me. I'm just saying, she was, she was pretty, she was something, pretty fearsome. And I stood there and opened my heart up to God, and they began to pray for people to receive the Holy Spirit. And as they touched people, they began to fall. And I'm not into flaky, wacko stuff, you know, don't get me wrong. But when the Holy Spirit's moving, powerful things can happen. And a miracle happened that day because. Literally 400 people just fell to the ground. And this lady in front of me, she fell on top of me. And as she did, I felt this presence of God go through me that I, I could hardly describe. And, and this was a, a traditional church with pews. And so there was a pew with an armrest. You know, the what do you call the arm of the pew? And that hit me right in the square in the middle of my back. And that woman was on top of me. And she was a good 300 and some pounds. And I'm thinking, oh boy, this is going to hurt. Do you know, it didn't hurt. There I was, squashed under that woman. <laughs> and in the presence of God, it was the craziest thing. And I remember a, a new zeal took a hold of my life. And I would ride my bike over to the park and I'd pray in the Spirit for 20, 30 minutes, just seeking God, praying, 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 right? And uh, I began to experience God's presence in church on a regular basis. We would go to the church service and, and this whole revolution of, of worship music took place in the church. And it really was birthed out of the charismatic movement. And, and I, I think it's touched literally every church and every denomination has been touched by the worship that happens in church now. And it's wonderful. But as a young boy, 12 years old, I remember going to this church in Surrey and they had a full-on band and they played horns and saxophones and had drums. And, and I remember I'd stand there and I'd lift up my hands and I'd feel God's presence. I'd be like, wow. Wow. Just I couldn't wait to be there. 
Well, as a young adult, I had wandered away a bit from God over my teenage years, and, and I had lost that sense of God's presence in my life. And, and I actually really came to a point, <coughs> it was probably about your age, Dylan, where I really questioned whether I believed in God. I had all of these experiences of my childhood, but as a young adult, I didn't get in heaps of trouble. You know, there's, I don't have a criminal record or anything like that. Still a good kid, but I did wander from God. And I became very cold. And I remember my youth pastor coming up to me and, and, and at one point and saying, you know, Mark, do you really know God? So I see you in worship and, and it's just like you're going through the motions. You're not connecting with God. I said, I don't know. I don't know what I believe. And I kind of cried. I don't know. I'm not sure. And that started me on a journey of hungering to know God as an adult. I was probably 17. I don't know how old you are, but 17? I was 17. I started wanting to know God. I said, God, where are you? God, I want to know you. And for about, well, probably five or six months, I prayed this prayer from David. It's the only thing I felt I could connect with. David, who had served God and been so close to God and then was involved in adultery and murder, and then he wrote this prayer. And his prayer said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me and restore unto me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your, with your free spirit. And, and I began to pray that prayer every day, saying, God, if you're real, create in me a clean heart. God, if you're real, Renew a right spirit within me. God, if you're real, don't take your presence from me. Let me know you. God, if you're real, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Let me feel what I felt when I was 12 and 13 years old, God. And I just prayed that prayer and prayed that prayer and prayed that prayer. And uh, I think it was in the month of November, we had moved way up into the hills, up past Rock Creek, up in the mountains. And I was walking along the mountain road late at night and uh, prayed that prayer again. I looked up in the heavens and began to pray that prayer and said, God, are you real? Are you there? Lord, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit. Cast me not away. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me, God. God, if you're real, touch me again. And just like that, it's like God just filled me in that moment. There I was on that mountain road and I was just, I could feel His glory. I was in His presence again. Amen. And I knew God's glory filled me in a tangible way that night. And I've never gone back. Amen. I believe that God has chosen to reveal His glory through broken humanity. And that through the brokenness in our lives is where God wants to reveal Himself in our lives. And I think He takes great pleasure in coming into our lives and things that, that we might be embarrassed of and things that we might be ashamed of, mistakes that we have made, failures, that God loves to come and to take our lives and redeem those things and reveal His glory through our brokenness. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful thought? That God would reveal His glory through our brokenness? That's the whole purpose of Christ coming because God is greater than our mistakes. He is greater than our past. He is greater than our sin. He is greater than our rebellion. He is greater than our bad attitudes. He is greater than anything we could come up with. And He, <coughs> he reveals His glory through our lives. Every time He takes a life and redeems it, He's revealing His glory. Amen? I believe this too. Every time we approach God in worship, we have an opportunity to behold His glory. There's no longer a veil that separates us from the presence of God. Amen? We just have to come in His grace and come in faith. In fact, that's what I think worship is. That's what I think worship is meant to be. It's broken humanity seeking divinity. 
It's broken man in our humanness seeking to know God in His glory. Us as men connecting with God. Amen? Who is divine. It's more than words of praise. It's more than the music and the sound and the excellence and the atmosphere and the building. It's more than all of that. Worship is a relationship with man and God. That's what it's meant to be. And every time we come to worship, Every time we come with an open heart, every time we come to seek God, every time we enter into His presence, we have an opportunity to behold His glory in our lives. Amen? So I want to encourage us today, let's live to know His glory. Let's live to experience His glory. Let's live for His glory. Amen?